You're sitting on the couch and your cat spots you. You hear his meow and with one jump, he's next to you. He's licking your hand. That's because he tastes pineapple from what you were just eating. But that's not the only reason why cats lick you. They might be grooming you, just like they do with their kittens. It also means they love you and that they might be marking territory. When other kittens come sniffing around, they'll know who you really belong to. If your cat starts nipping on your hair when you're lying down, this is them trying to give you a bath, exactly as they do it themselves. When you're petting your cat and he starts looking at you funny, it means they've had enough of it. Cats bite when they want something to stop. For example, when you're trimming their nails, a bite can help them out. Now, if it works out once, they'll know that's what they have to do every time nail trimming happens. Instead of meowing, they can also nip you for attention. Maybe they feel like playing. But if a cat's biting and just won't let go, they're either trying to assert their rule or trying to deal with a threat. If they do this to a toy, it's probably better to get rid of it. If you don't, it can stress your cat out. Before a cat is ready to defend themselves or if they're feeling irritated, they let out a low meow that's kind of worrying. Pay extra attention to your cat when you hear this. Low but sweet meows means they're saying hello to you and that they're happy you're home. Now, you're cooking lunch and down there is your kitty, sitting and staring at you next to its food bowl, barely blinking. Even if the bowl isn't entirely empty, your bud could be asking for more food. Or they're just letting you know that they love you. Pay attention to their eyes. If the eyelids are half closed and they give you a few slow blinks, it means they're giving you eye kisses. It's a sign they absolutely adore you. If they start trying to bury their food, they might not like it. So look into some other cat food. It's normal and instinctive for cats to claw everything. They do it to stretch their body as well as flex their feet and claws. They can also be claiming territory by leaving a mark and their scent. Because their claws have layers, scratching also helps them get rid of the claw's outer layer, keeping them sharp. Fleming is the official name of what happens when cats stare at you with their mouths open. They do it when they've just smelled something, and it ended up being too complex for their tiny noses. So they use the roof of their mouth to make sense of the smell. When you're sitting down reading a good book, your cat coming to keep you company and sleeping on your lap is as good of a feeling for you as it is for them. When it comes to sleeping, warmth for them is more important than comfort. They probably find you very warm. It also means it trusts you enough to keep it safe when it's in a vulnerable position. And when they're sleeping on you, they also think of it as both of you bonding. Mm. Cats used to knead on their mother's chest when they were little kittens. They did this to stimulate milk productions. And when they're doing this to you, it means they feel comfortable around you. They're likely going to be purring too. When they're on your lap, they might slightly hit you in the face with their head or rub their chin on you. This is just another way of saying you belong to them and that they love you. Some cats might even drool when they're purring, which is another sign of affection, really. But suddenly, they get up and bolt out of there as fast as they can. They might have spotted a bug and started chasing after it, or they're just burning off excess energy. Kittens usually do this more often than older cats, and it's nothing to worry about. It's just that they lay around not doing much during the day. So whenever they get the zoomies, off they go. Come here, kitty! Nah, not again. It's ignoring me. We can't blame them, though. Much of their behavior is based on instincts. In the wild, cat mothers only use vocal communication when there's danger around. If there's nothing to worry about, cats stay silent. They don't need to communicate like we do, voicing concerns and showing emotions. Dogs do that too, jumping around when they're happy, for example. Cats seem to be moodier though. They'll come to you, but only if they feel like it. They also crave attention. It's okay if they ignore you, but you can't ignore them. They'll put themselves in all sorts of places, forcing you to notice them. A common one is laying on top of your keyboard while you're trying to get work done or popping their head between your arms and the book you're reading. They also ask for your attention by laying down next to you and stretching. Maybe now's a good time for a cuddle session. 
If you notice them twitching their ears, give them space for now. It's a sign they might be feeling anxious and agitated. Humans aren't the only ones that throw hissy fits. Cats do it too, but in their way. They do it by chattering a lot. It usually means they're unhappy they didn't get what they wanted. It could happen when a cat's trying to catch a fly but can't. Both of your cats are looking at each other funny. The one at the right has its tail twitching, and it's getting faster and faster. And he's jumped on his brother. It means they're focused and excited like their ancestors, looking out for prey. At home, it just means they want to play. Coming to you with a straight tail means excitement. They usually don't walk like this, so give them attention. They're happy to spend time with you. If their tail is low, they might be feeling scared or even frightened. Act gentle around them and be sure not to startle them. If your cat is chewing on things that aren't meant to be chewed on, say inedible plants or plastic, even metal sometimes, you might want to take them to the vet. It doesn't mean something bad for every cat, and sometimes they might just be curious. Now, sloths can hold their breath longer than dolphins. Yep, incredible but true. They slow their heart rate so much they can stay under the surface for up to 40 minutes. Unlike fish, dolphins and whales are aquatic mammals, which means they can't breathe underwater. When it comes to breathing, they're more similar to us than the fish. Both of them have lungs, and they breathe air through something we know as a blowhole. When they're under the surface, they hold their breath until they come up for some air again. Dolphins can stay under the water for 10 minutes. A sperm whale can hold its breath for 90 minutes, while an elephant seal holds the record when it comes to aquatic mammals and can stay under the water for 2 hours without having to go up. There's a wasp so tiny, much tinier than its name, it's smaller than an amoeba, even though amoebas are made of one cell only. You can see this wasp has the same body parts as the rest of the bugs – wings, brain, eyes, and the rest – but it's really a tiny version of an insect since it's only eight thousandths of an inch long. And the smallest adult insect we know of is a parasitic wasp with a big name, also known as the fairy fly. Their males don't have wings, they're blind and only five thousandths of an inch long. Now, it's no coincidence each animal species has different colors and patterns. One of the reasons for that is to help them stand out when looking for their potential mating partners or to send a warning to predators they're poisonous and hope they get the message right. Then there are ambush predators, such as tigers. It's very important for them to remain invisible because the difference is huge. If their prey sees them before they get there, no dinner that night. But why exactly are tigers orange? For us, orange is a color used for things that need to be ultra-visible. For example, items such as safety vests or traffic cones. To the human eye, orange will mostly stand out in the environment. So if there's a tiger coming for you, you'll spot it relatively easily. But humans have so-called trichromatic color vision. When light from your surroundings enters your eye, it hits the retina, a thin layer located in the back. To process that light, the retina uses two kinds of light receptors, rods and cones. Rods can only distinguish differences in light and darkness. They can't sense color. Our eyes will mostly rely on rods in dim light. Cones are in charge of color perception. Humans mostly have three types – cones for green, blue, and red. That's exactly why we call our vision trichromatic. Most humans see three primary colors, together with their colorful combinations. Apes and some monkeys also have such a style of vision. But most mammals that live on land, including cats, horses, deer, and dogs, have dichromatic color vision. Retinas in their eyes have cones for two colors only, green and blue. When humans get information from their green and blue cones only, They're considered colorblind since they can't, for example, tell the difference between green and red shades. This is similar with mammals that live on land. Deer are surely tigers' prey way more than humans. And deer don't see tigers as orange, but green. Green tigers would surely be more difficult to spot, which would mean more dinner for tigers. But evolution still decided to go with orange because it's simply easier to produce such a color. The only green mammal is a sloth, but its fur is not naturally green. It's because of the algae that grows in it. 
and they can hold their breath for 40 minutes. The water around the poles can get very cold during certain periods of the year. There's plenty of fish that live there, but when that happens, they need to swim away to survive. But there's a special group of fish native to the Southern Ocean near Antarctica. The temperatures there are from 28 to 39 degrees Fahrenheit. Technically, that's below freezing, but all those dissolved salts in the seawater don't allow it to freeze over. And these fish can survive because they have a special feature called glycoprotein. It helps them stay in their home because it acts as sort of a natural antifreeze. It's a protein that prevents all those ice crystals from forming in their blood and helps it continue to flow normally. Have you ever wondered how tiny animals like ants breathe? Try to open your mouth and throat, but at the same time, hold your chest and diaphragm still. The diaphragm is a muscular structure that separates the chest and abdominal cavities in all mammals. It expands as you breathe. If you can't do this, you can't hold your breath because oxygen will still find its way into your lungs. At least, enough of it to keep up with your body's demands. But generally, when you breathe, diaphragm is actively pumping air in and out of your body. To survive without the diaphragm doing so, you'd need more than one throat and a way smaller body. Now, ants have 9 or 10 pairs of openings along the sides of their tiny bodies. They're called spiracles and each is connected to branching series of tubes. It's a system similar to human lungs. Their blood doesn't carry oxygen from those tubes to the rest of the body. Instead, the tubes spread this oxygen. The endings of these branches directly touch the membranes of their cells. This can only work in really small animals. When the body is bigger than 8 tenths of an inch, these tubes are too long, so they can't diffuse air fast enough. Lions, elephants, and bears! Oh my! Three of the most beautiful yet intimidating members of the animal kingdom. But what intimidates these creatures, if anything? You might be surprised. Let's take a look. How about we start with the universally recognized king of the jungle, the lion? We'll get to the elephants in a moment, but there's actually one in the room. You know, the one that claims that a certain jungle cat is afraid of the most vital substance known to man? A small hint, it covers 70% of Earth's surface. So, is it true? Is the ferocious lion afraid of water? It's actually a myth. Lions enjoy taking a dip in the water because it allows them to cool off. This makes sense if you think about the climates the creatures have to face. Temperatures in a savanna climate range from 68 to 86 degrees Fahrenheit. You know all of us humans hit the beach whenever the weather is like that. So why should we expect anything different from the lion? Especially given that the creatures typically carry around between 280 and 420 pounds of weight, as well as a thick coat of fur. The ironic thing about this whole lions are afraid of water myth is that they're actually fantastic swimmers. The same goes for all of your other favorite large cats from these warm weather climates, such as tigers, leopards, jaguars, and ocelots. It's actually large cats from cold climates that do their best to avoid water. This applies to such felines as bobcats, lynxes, and snow leopards. The latter lives in places like the cold alpine tundra biome. That's a rocky mountainous area. Temperatures there, on average, get as low as 33 degrees Fahrenheit. Again, it makes perfect sense that these big, cold weather cats despise water. Getting their fur coats wet would dampen their chances of staying warm, pun intended. I don't think you have to look too far to piece together where this lions are afraid of water myth comes from. In fact, there's a good chance for some of you watching this video that the reason is near your computer screen right now, jumping around and causing mischief. That's right, we may have jumped ourselves to a conclusion that certain behavioral aspects of our own pet cats would match that of a lion. House cats, though related to all the previously mentioned big cats, are not actually directly descended from them. They instead have developed over millions of years from a single wild ancestor that still exists in the wild today, the Near Eastern wild cat. As water is not plentiful in the Middle East, these cats were not exposed to it to any great degree. Like their descendants, they only appreciate it as a food source. 
As you likely see with your pet, they hardly bathe, swim, or interact with water in general. Lucky for them, they don't even need to. These domestic felines use their tongues to clean themselves. They can do this because their tongues have tiny hook-shaped papillae. They assist cats in grooming out knots and keeping the coat clean, sweet-smelling, and in overall Mm. immaculate shape. Cats, in general, are individualistic creatures. And you may be screaming at your screen right now, proclaiming that your cat, in fact, loves water. And this is definitely possible. Some cats even like to play with water. For example, drips from the tap or bubbles in the bath. There are specific breeds of house cats that are known to enjoy the aqua life more than others. The Turkish Van, for example, which is also appropriately known as the swimming cat. It's believed that the breed developed an affinity for water by swimming in Lake Van to cool down. This lake is in the area the animals evolved from. Moving on to a problem a cat definitely doesn't have to deal with. Have you ever heard of musophobia, also known as surifobia? Both words are valid names for a fear of mice and rats. There is a common belief that one particular animal that has this fear is the beautiful elephant. That's right, the same animal that, depending on the species, stands at the height of roughly 10 feet and weighs about 9,000 pounds. It's supposedly afraid of a creature that is a mere 4 inches in length and weighs less than one pound. But why did this belief appear? Well, the reasoning for this rumor is based on the possibility that elephants are paranoid about mice climbing inside their trunks. If a mouse succeeded in doing this, there would be a potential that it could cause irritation and blockage within the trunk. Now, I'm not trying to be the guy who spoils parties, but it looks like this belief is also a myth. Researchers claim that there's no concrete evidence that suggests elephants are afraid of mice. The most they'll concede is that the giant animal may sometimes take fright by the sudden appearance of the tiny rodent, which is the exact same for ourselves. Why is it that dogs like herring sticks so much? Well, first of all, it comes naturally to them. It's based on their instincts to retrieve things when they hunt. But it might be that they just want to play with you, and you've forgotten the ball at home. A clear sign of this is if it drops the stick right at your feet and starts looking up at you. Dogs love the smell and texture of sticks, so they love gnawing on them. This even helps keep their gums and teeth healthy and relieves pain. Coming home back from a walk, your dog might lay down after a while and start licking his paws. This is completely normal because even though they don't need to groom themselves as often as cats do, dogs still try to keep themselves clean, especially their paws. If they do it more often than usual, though, you should take a closer look. It might mean that they've injured their paw, or there might be something stuck in it that they just can't get rid of. Make sure to examine the paw that they're licking thoroughly to make sure there's nothing wrong. If you're unsure, go hear what the vet has to say. Your dog shakes its toys with a crazed passion when it's playing, doesn't it? This is something they got from their ancestors, the wolves and their hunting instincts. Don't worry, though. It doesn't mean your dog's aggressive. It's just having fun. Like cats, dogs also get zoomies, the burst of energy that makes them run around the house like nuts. But it's a little different for dogs. They also do this because they're happy. Many dogs don't like being bathed, and it makes them feel nervous and anxious. When they're done, some will zoom off like an indie car. They do this because it helps them shake off water and burn off that pent-up nervous energy. Hearing a siren will more likely than not make your dog howl. Contrary to popular opinion, they're not just doing this because they dislike the noise or it hurts their ears. It also triggers instincts to howl because they think of the siren as another dog that's howling too. It can also happen when people play the piano or flute next to them. Several things can trigger their howling. Yep, my dog Riley loves to howl when I'm playing my trumpet. Some dogs have an instinct to eat grass. Some might just enjoy how it tastes, but it's more likely that they eat it because it used to help them clear bad things, like parasites, out of their bodies. This works because grass is so high in fiber. You should discourage this as a dog owner, though, because the grass can cause problems with digestion. When your dog sits on your feet, it means they're letting other dogs know that you belong to them. They're marking their territory and showing affection while they do it. Dogs say hello to each other by sniffing each other's butts. 
They do this because their incredible sense of smell allows them to learn a lot about this new acquaintance. Some can even determine if the other pup is feeling a particular emotion. A yawn for a dog can have the same meaning as it does for us, sleepiness. But it has other meanings as well. If a dog yawns while you're trying to train it, it might mean that it's getting frustrated. Letting out a big yawn might be its way of giving itself a mental break. It might even mean they've gotten sick of what they're doing and they want to stop. Not only that, it can also be a sign that they're stressed and nervous, like when they're at the vet and clearly don't want to be there. On the other hand, it might mean that they're enthusiastic, like the yawn before going on a walk. That's always a good one. Rolling on their back asking for a belly rub is something a lot of dogs do. It feels great for them to get their first stroke, but it's also a sign that they trust you. Ever notice how their little leg kicks when you scratch their belly? It's called a scratch reflex, and they have no control over it. You're activating nerves under his skin when you scratch his belly. Those are the same nerves that act when dogs are trying to get rid of something irritating, like a bug that's stuck on their fur. Another sign of your dog's affection for you is when it licks you. Their moms used to clean and bond with them the same way when they were puppies. It's a great way to get your attention to when you're on the couch too busy looking at your phone. And when they do it to your face, it's likely they either want food or just want a taste of that leftover meatloaf you had for lunch. Tail wagging has a bunch of different meanings for dogs. Some research has claimed that if dogs' tails are wagging more to the right, it means they're showing happy emotions, while wagging to the left might mean the feelings are more negative. Their tails are a gateway for us to understand them better. A scared dog will usually have its tail down, and an alert or excited dog will hold their tail much higher than usual. If they're curious, their tail will be straight. And finally, a stiff and vertical tail means that you should watch out for aggression. You might feel sad if you hear your dog crying or whimpering, but it doesn't always mean the same thing it does in humans. Dogs use these cries as a form of communication that they learned while they were puppies. Puppies whimper to ask their moms for stuff. So when they grow older, that's how they communicate with us, too. These cries can mean all kinds of things. It could mean that the dog's excited. It might mean that they want your attention, or even that they got hurt. There isn't one good explanation for every whimper. But you might actually be encouraging your dog to whimper, too. If you take your dog out for a walk every time it whines, it learns that whining helps it to get what it wants. So it's a learned behavior as well. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side.